So now how do I use that here? Remember, what I want to do is I want to show the equivalence. This is the first part of the proof. I want to show the equivalence between these two integrals. Where do you want me to start? Okay, so I'm going to take I1. Okay. I'm just going to take it as is. And then I'm going to reflect it across. Now, just quickly, I told you there was reflection. You can kind of see it. Where am I reflecting across? Where am I reflecting across? It looks to me like I've used this axis of, well, it's not really an axis of symmetry, is it? Because it's not a symmetrical function. But when you take these two together, right, that's where I'm flipping across, right? That's where I'm flipping across. So that's why 0 and A stay on the same distances away from that, that midpoint, okay? So I'm reflecting this now from naught to pi, boundaries stay put, right? But I'm going to reflect it across pi on 2. That's where I'm going to go. That's halfway between these boundaries, yeah? So therefore, this is going to become pi minus x. All of the x's become pi minus x's, right? And then you've got 1 plus cos squared pi minus x. And that's all of the integrand changed. It's still with respect to the same variable. It's not with respect to pi minus x, thankfully. Though it could be if I wanted to. Okay. All right, now, this looks good. This looks good. What am I going to need to change? This sign. I'm going to have to change the sign, right? Now, you can do this through a graph, or if you want, you can do this purely algebraically. You can do this through the identities. This is a compound angle, right? This is a sine a minus b. Yeah, so therefore, sine of a minus b is equal to sine a cos b. Take away, uh, yeah, it, whichever one you like, really. I'm going to write that. Okay. What's sine pi? Sine pi? It's zero, right? Uh, you've got a negative, there's a sine x. What's cos pi? Negative one. Bam, that's exactly what I wanted. Okay. But I'm not only am I going to have to change the sine, I'm going to have to change the cosine, right? So I say, oh, okay, well, let's just do this again. Again, and like I said, you can do this algebraically. You can shift pi units and then you can reflect it if you like. But this is just as easy, I think. This is not going to be sine cos, sine cos. This is going to be cos, cos, plus sine, sine. Yes? Tell me again what cos pi is? Negative one. Tell me again what sine pi is? It's zero. And you're like, whoa, oh, hold on. Ah, but I don't have a cosine. I have a cosine squared, right? So, and this, by the way, I will point out, being that this is a proof, this actually comes from an exam, I think I mentioned to you before, and this is a critical spot where don't fudge and don't miss out this step. Okay? So I'm gonna go naught to pi. On my numerator, everything is looking sweet because I just showed that that's the case. But on my denominator, right, this is not just 1 plus cos squared x. It's actually 1 plus negative cos, and that's what's being squared, yeah? Don't take that shortcut. Don't just write cos squared. If you just write that, then you're just, you're just regurgitating what the question has told you, right? You didn't have to understand anything to write that. So this is a minor difference, but it's an important one with respect to x. You happy with that? And I'll just tidy it up so that I get I2. Uh, that's just cos squared. I'm done. Yes? You could also do it if you met this and give it like this one as well. Why would I do that? Because um, when you put it in the sign, you get a negative sign. Oh yeah, okay. So you're introducing a negative that will then end up changing. No, um, so if it's x minus pi, if you let x equal x minus pi, um, it means that the um, pi minus x bits become x minus pi, mm -hmm. and then the sine would become uh, minus sine x. Yep. And then you introduce the negative, the negative into the, um, the x minus pi, and it becomes a pi minus x. Seems to be fine, but there are just two problems. Number, well, not problems, but firstly, I'm not going to be able to take advantage of that property. That's the first thing. Do you notice that? 
that what you just said is not that property, yeah? And secondly, I think you are just introducing a double negative, as far as I can see, which is like, why introduce a double negative if I can just introduce it without the negatives, yeah? Exactly, which is why I just showed you. Yeah. Oh, you got five percent batteries. Cool. I'm going to talk faster. Okay, yes? Um, the working out of the right hand side, is that the story that you said you did? Yep. No! 6% battery. Okay. Let's keep moving, shall we? Should we keep moving? Okay, now what was part two, or part B rather? Uh, yeah, you wanted to take a sum, okay? So let's quickly have a go at this. I, this is part B, I1 plus I2. Now, just given the time and because I think you can see it, I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut here. What I've got is a pair of integrals, same boundaries, same denominators. Yes? Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Why don't you just use I2? When you split it up, you get I2 equals integral of pi sine x minus I1, then you can just split it up. So that is what I'm about to do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Patience, young Padawan. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, I can actually just like notice, right, if the boundaries are the same, the denominator is the same, the variable integration is the same, the only thing that changes is the numerators, right? So therefore, I'm going to stay from 0 to pi, okay? But then what I've got on the numerator is going to be x sine x plus pi minus x oh. sine x. Do you see that? Right? It's just the two numerators, I've just combined them into one. And then you've got this denominator down here. Are you happy with that? Okay, now what's brilliant about this is because look at what the numerators do. The combined numerators, I should say, right? You've got an x sine x there, and then you've got a minus x sine x there. So these two are just going to cancel, cancel. What are they going to leave you with on the numerator? A pi sine x. Now that pi is just a constant, so I'm going to bring it out the front. Pi. Which leaves you with this. Okay. Put your integration hat on. What's that look like? Now, maybe it's not entirely obvious to you, but this is going to become 10 inverse to make it clear, right? Because it certainly wasn't to me clear, to clear to me the first time. I'm going to make a substitution, which is suitable. So I'm going to set Lee, let u equal to cos x, because then I'll get a 1 plus u squared on the denominator. If that's the case, of course, I need du on dx, which is good. Okay, now I have a sine x in there. So I'm just going to put this minus sign over here. And then I've got some boundaries, right? I better change my boundaries. So when uh, x equals 0, what's u going to be? Cos of 0, which is 1. And when x equals pi, u is going to equal cos of pi, which is negative 1. Yep. So, what have I got now? I'm going to say pi from new boundaries are 1 to negative 1. Yep. Then you've got uh, the sine x on the top is going to give me that negative du on dx that I want to change my variable of integration. What's my denominator? 1 plus, one plus u squared. And then there's the dx that was already there, which cancels. Okay? Suggestions. We've got some definite integral properties we could use here, right? There's a negative sign I don't really want there. It's a bit of a pest. I also have some boundaries that seem like they're in a weirdo looking order. What am I going to do? Yeah, I'm going to use the reverse property. This integral has actually been integrated over a, a backwards interval. So I'm going to take that negative sign out the front, which just promptly changes the order of my boundaries, right? And this is just. Well, that's about as textbooked as you get for a, um, a 10 inverse integral, right? So this is now pi outside of 10 inverse of u from negative 1 to 1. Okay, top boundary first, what's 10 inverse of 1? That's pi over 4. Take away, what's 10 inverse of negative 1? Well, I could have, in fact, if I was even lazier, I could have noticed this is an odd function. So I could have doubled it and gone from 0 to 1, which, I, which I've just done. But anyway, I've already gotten this far, so that's negative pi on 4. But you can see in here, pi on 4 plus pi on 4, pi on 2, which gives me the pi squared on 2 that I was after. Okay. Yay. Now, we're pretty much done. The last bit is really just kind of uh, a tr algebraically trivial, but it's a really nice way to tie this up in a bow. Part C was to evaluate I1, right? 
But if I just carry on directly from this line, I know that I2 is I1. So this is what I get, just carrying on from the previous question. So therefore, I1 is I squared on 4. Okay. That was the easiest mark in the whole paper, right? So that's kind of cool because look at this. Just look back at the original question. You're like, what a mess. Do I really have to do that by parts, substitution, whatever, okay? I don't even know if you can, right? I don't know if, we know if we have the tools yet to do that analytically, but because it's a definite integral, we can take advantage of, and you can see how many properties we took advantage of just by going through that one question. Okay?